Welcome back to Radically Rethinking Railways in Australia with your host, the Mad Professor. This episode is about politics, partisan politics. Some people have described politics as war by other means. As interesting as the question, what politics is about, a better question is what tools it uses. And the main tool it uses is persuasion. Recapping our second episode, why are we here? This channel exists to persuade you to change your thinking about Australian railways. Because your thinking is both influenced by politics, but in turn it influences politics. And that locks Australian railways into a political trajectory based on how people think about it. If you think railways are going to change, in ways beyond anyone's control, or only for the worse. That may not be right, but it is more likely to be so if more people think this way. And that is what we are setting out to change. The false narratives that set Australian Rail on the wrong path were made up deliberately. Some were created by the bureaucracy to limit their liability for the damage they caused. Some other narratives are folk narratives like the ones we saw in our episode, Those Were the Days, My Friends. One author, Patsy Adam Smith, did a lot of harm to Australian Rail by popularising a particular way of looking at it. A giant social club for rail employees. And a glorious place for the lack of technological change. And it's not that these narratives were taken particularly seriously within the bureaucracy, but they did afford some cover to those who did not want to spend the money on change. Folk narratives help members of the community. Rail employees, enthusiasts and historians cope with the enduring failure that we have seen since at least the 1920s. But of course, some narratives are made by the political class, politicians and parties. We will look at these today. We will take a closer look at a few governments that have caused our enthusiast community palpitations. Not necessarily in chronological order. Telling the story backwards can help us make sense of it. And then look at what we can do about these narratives. Our favourite narrative for riling the enthusiasts is the Victorian government of Jeff Kennett. But we'll also look at the governments of John Kane, Nick Greiner and Joe Biocchi peterson and even the federal governments of Hawke, Keating and Howard, who had a lot less to do with rail, but not zero. And it is worth disclosing, your mad professor protested against Jeff Kennett back in the day. The point is, you can hate these parties or love them as much as you like, but you don't get to tell lies about them. Let's get started. In October 1992, the Labor government of Joan Kerner lost office and was replaced by the Liberal government of Jeff Kennett. One of the worst electoral defeats Labor had experienced in recent years and in the middle of a very tough recession. It hadn't all been Labor's fault that the recession happened. That was down to the Federal Government and Reserve Bank, as well as global issues, like the money markets bidding up the price of money to pay for East Germany's reconstruction. But it hit Victoria pretty hard and it was on top of a half decade of financial scandals, such as the collapse of the Pyramid Building Society and various problems with non-bank finance companies like Estate Mortgage and Tricontinental. These left Victoria feeling pretty poor. Can it hit the ground with an agenda? And unfortunately, this agenda included rail closures. We will look a bit later at Kane having reintroduced those services 10 years earlier. But what is important now is that Kennett had the mandate to close services. Kennett ended up governing for two terms, and it is a common misunderstanding among rail enthusiasts who Kennett was, what his motivations and goals were, and what he actually did. First of all, his first term agenda from 1992 to 1996 was to create a sense of crisis and panic, and blame the need for it on the Labour Party, who he called the Guilty Party. It was a political strategy to destroy Labour and prevent them returning for as long as possible. You might be tempted to think it was deeply ideological, 
but really it was aimed at keeping Labor and their union friends down. Rail was not a major target for Kennett in the early 1990s. He commissioned a report which found the lines were losing money. Though possibly quite inconveniently, the Warrnambool service may not have actually been losing money. This one, after some wrangling, was given to the West Coast Railway, an offshoot of the Bellarine Railway. They went and acquired their own locos and rolling stock, and even put a steam loco on the train on weekends. That's a story for another episode. And the Shepparton line, quite arbitrarily, was given to the local bus company. So they then chose just to use V-Line equipment as before. The Lee and Gather and Cobram services and the Gippsland line beyond sale were unceremoniously booted. And with minimal freight on these lines, they soon withered and died. The Dimboola Day service also ceased, with no trains there except for the overland when freight was moved off the main Adelaide line onto the route via Cressy, the line from Ballarat to Ararat was abandoned. We will come back to this. But with Mornington Peninsula politicians on their own side, getting loud about this, they backed off. The trains had the last laugh at the end of Kennett's second term. Pause that thought. As part of Kennett's labour and union bashing, it was important for Kennett to attack the foundations of Labor's support. And that was the public service, health and education unions, and other public sector bodies. The public service had massive job cuts. So did hospitals and schools. And the public utilities like electricity, gas and water were privatised. This had two benefits for Kennett cutting the nexus between those industries and the labour movement, but also funnelling public assets to his friends and the sale proceeds into Treasury. This was so he could reclaim the AAA credit rating, which he set as a goal of his government. This political strategy was fairly successful and saw Kennett re-elected in 1996, reminding Victorians of Labour being the guilty party. Where a lot of rail fans go wrong is talking about his line closures. Not a centimetre of the suburban rail system was closed. Unlike his Labor predecessor, the tramways too looked like a target, but were actually expanded, even if only by a few hundred metres. Apart from the lines we've already mentioned, not many more country lines were closed. There wasn't much left to close after his Labor predecessor Kane and the Liberals before them closed most of everything. And while his record is definitely marred by what he did to country passenger services, often overlooked is that he upgraded the upfield line, which had been threatened in the time of John Kane. When the CityLink freeway was built, it seemed obvious to rip up the upfield line to build it. Instead, they built it up on viaducts, and the first few kilometres of the upfield line got a rebuild. He also reintroduced passenger trains to Echuca. Even if this was a very limited service, it was something, and provided a base for improving that service when Steve Brax came to power. And with many station staff being cut from stations, they set in place a limited program, where stations would be upgraded if they were labelled premium and had staffing. Despite everything, and its transport minister Alan Brown was well regarded. We mentioned he had the goal of destroying Labor rather than any political ideology, but Treasury were very keen on ideology. Nonsense beyond privatisation, things called competition policy, contestable services, public-private partnerships, and every other thing designed to bring in the Treasury worldview. Kennett didn't see this coming and ended up becoming the political vehicle for doing what the senior bureaucrats wanted. And that was knowing that if the public didn't like it, Kennett, not the bureaucrats, would take the punishment. And so it was. Victoria's sense of economic crisis, which Kennett deliberately stoked, was over by the late 1990s. 
Yet the cost cutting and restraint had not stopped. While Kennett could possibly have opened the wallet a bit, Treasury failed to tell him he could, and why would they? Those rail services that had been cut could probably have been put back, with money flowing back in. Just like ten years earlier, it wouldn't have cost them much. And the rural electorates that were missing out, the likes of South Gippsland, Ararat, Mildura and Bairnsdale, were starting to talk about voting independent instead of Liberal or National. And these independents would use rail service as leverage with a future Labor government. A story for a future video, but no help to Kennett. His political instincts blinded him. He no longer had a goal, and Treasury kept telling him there was no money. It only took a series of unfortunate events. The unpopular Labor leader was ousted. A few of his own members died or retired. And rural people were thoroughly disgusted with the government, focused on new things for Melbourne alone. So in 1999 he was gone. He is correctly remembered for being divisive and for many people who lost their jobs. But blaming him for what happened to rail is a bit of a stretch. Many rail fans choose to not remember the rail system as it stood in 1999. The Gather was just about fit for trains. The Cobram line was still trafficable. Bansdale and Ararat had seen rail movements. Dimboola and Mildura could have had their trains restored. But just as rail had been a weapon for Kennett, the stories about it would become a weapon for Brax. And we'd expect that from a politician, but we can expect better from enthusiasts. John Kane was elected in 1982, after nearly 20 years of Liberal government. That Liberal government marked a sad period for the Victorian Railways network, as much of it, including the most scenic bits, were closed. And that is sad for enthusiasts. What is probably sadder for everyone else was the lost opportunities in that period to have built a better railway. Maybe we can save that for a future episode. The worst of it was near the end of the period. We saw in episode 3, the accidental death of a railway. The 1970s was a conspiracy against the Heelsville line on Wurundjeri country. Near the end of the Liberal period that line closed, and with it the lines to Mornington and Stony Point, beyond Hastings in Bunurong land. The passenger services to Lee and Gatha and Yarram on Gunai Kunai lands, Chuka and Cobram in the Yorta Yorta country also finished. There are others we could also list, but seeing as these remain closed, they are not part of today's story. As we saw with Kennett a decade earlier, the public anger at rail closures was one factor among many that finally saw the end of the Liberal government, and John Kane capitalised on that from opposition, with the fleasy promise to put the rail services back. One positive thing that happened during the end of the Liberal government was a positive commitment to get rid of the last of the non-air-conditioned country rolling stock and its replacement with new air-conditioned carriages called NSETs and rebuilt or new locomotives to go with it. This was called the New Deal, and it was really the first vote of confidence in country railways since the spirit of progress in the 1930s, which we saw in our episode 14, or even earlier, maybe the 1920s. Kane reinstating the trains to Lee and Gatha, Cobram and Stony Point should definitely be given a big thumbs up. We mentioned in episode 3 that only a few hundred thousand dollars was required to get the Cobram line upgraded to almost mainline standards in the early 1980s. This was true for all these lines, they needed work, but not that much. And providing a train fleet for them was not much of an ask. In the case of Lee and Gatha, they used some old Harris carriages, air conditioned and fitted out for interurban journeys. Not that nice if you ask your mad professor, but enough. Stony Point got some of these carriages, hauled by the Tulloch air-conditioned diesel rail car. We will cover this car in some detail in a future episode. In other words, the whole thing was on the cheap. Which is a good thing, but also shows that they could have done a lot more of them, at a minimum. Hamilton and Portland in Gunjit Mara country. And if they'd used another of the Tullochs, Hillsville and Mornington should have also been possible. The whole thing is remembered well, but in your mad professor's estimation, too well and it allows us to gloss over the real problem of the era. What little else John Kane did in government for rail, apart from the pointless name changing to V-Line and the Met. It is hard to look back and find much good. Kane came to office promising a range of suburban rail extensions, notably the Doncaster line, 
a line via the Roeville area to Ferntree Gully, and a line from Dandenong to Frankston. You could be disappointed he did none of these, but even more disappointing is he didn't even try. These items were cribbed from the 1969 Melbourne Transportation Study. Not a single item had been reviewed in 14 years, and this was just laziness. Whether or not they had the money for any or all of these lines, they never put in place any plans. It is not that such plans were thwarted by politics or the economy, but they never had such plans to begin with. The one small thing they actually did was an extension of the Altona line, the first part of which, a kilometre to Westona, was a great idea. But the extension from there back to Laverton on the main line was a stupid idea and was symptomatic of the Kane period where a proper double track railway from Newport to Werribee was opened in 1983. It was strangled two short years later with the service rerouted into the small single track Altona line. Two stations on the main line were closed and while one, Galvin, was a no-hoper, the other, Paisley, still had a small suburban cluster of houses to serve. And this is all Kane had to show for his time. The later part of the Kane period, even before the economic problems began, were characterised by conflict. Conflict with the unions, most obviously. This was endemic through the 1985 to 1988 period. To be fair, much of that was caused by the federal government imposing new rules. Changes to the ticketing system were intended to save money, but were clumsily handled. Kane kicked an own goal by converting the St Kilda and Port Melbourne railways to so-called light railways. As we saw in our episode 6, What's in the Name? It really did nothing but cause more conflict. That episode pointed out that the real objective was to reclassify the lines in order to cheat an industrial agreement, leading to lower staffing because of the definitions of light and heavy railways, and possibly also to clear some railway land for the later casino. A lot of money was spent to move the rails a few inches, lower the voltage and demolish some of the stations. The vehicles may have been the same vehicles that Melbourne was using on its so-called tramways, but it is hard to see what was gained for all the money and all the fighting. Kane also showed his inclination to spread this conflict to the Upfield and Sandringham lines, and we should be grateful he didn't. So the question is, why so much promise for a Labor government after two decades of Liberal neglect, but so little done? If we really remember the Kane period, it was that this was a government of social workers. Kane and some of his ministers had a real passion for the social issues of the time. Getting the mentally ill and disabled out of the huge, cruel and Dickensian institutions. Giving or restoring rights to marginalised groups. Improving education. Closing down outdated hospitals and building new ones. Not one of his ministers had any great interest in the rail portfolio. The mid-2023 death of Tom Roper, nicknamed Snappy Tom, even shows that Labor history writers have learned nothing. Among the hagiographic praise, they note Tom as an environmentalist, but his concern for the environment never once extended to the trains under his management, as he was one of the worst of Kane's ministers. Going back to Kennett, we can be disappointed in Kennett closing the lines to Lee and Gather and Cobram, such as would never reopen again. But Kane had not exactly raised the bar very high. By the end of the government, people would only remember the economic problems, the industrial and community chaos, and on a good day, the social reforms. Labor on balance are always better for rail systems than Liberal, but we have some disappointing outliers and Kane was one of them. Moving north, we remember the period that followed the successful Rand government, which had been an orgy of spending on rail. Some of it well remembered. The V-set we covered briefly in our episode, Our Finest Hour, or the XPT, or the Tangara, which was introduced near the end. Some of it was poorly planned and targeted. For example, the mainline electrification of the 1980s we covered in our episode 9, Electric Dreams. But the period that follows is fascinating when we zoom in on the government of Nicholas Frank Greiner, which preceded Kennett by a few years, but was a good template for it. Rail enthusiasts spreading misinformation are inclined to lump Greiner's cutbacks with Kennett's, under the rubric of Liberals cutting rail. But Greiner had one similarity to Kennett, 
and that was his political program was to destroy labor. And unlike Pennett, who used the economy as his weapon, in this time, it was corruption. The RAN government stank to high heaven from corruption, a stench that didn't leave when Barry Unsworth, in his cardigan, became the temporary replacement after RAN retired. Nothing was proven, even after royal commissions, which suggests RAN was good at it. And unlike the Kane government, there was no sense that this Labor government was not managing finances well. The economy of New South Wales, and specifically Sydney, was humming as the Australian economy was opened up to international banking and finance, which flowed through into property development, tourism and company restructuring. Griner's very specific target was to nail Rand and cronies for what they did, their links to spivs and drug lords and the underbelly of Sydney's eastern suburbs. Like Kennett, he also knew Labor was drawing support from large unions, like the rail ones, and these would make an important target. Unlike Kennett, Griner and some of his cabinet, particularly the minister Bruce Baird, were notably dry, in that they believed strongly in the neoliberal hocus pocus. However, we should not overstate the role of ideology. Griner, deep in his roots, knew the same thing Rand did, that keeping the state railways functioning for city commuters and country travellers, as well as for the coal mining industry, was very important. He took the symbolic, rather than real, action of cancelling the last of the ComEng double deck interurban contracts. So we see two major events in Griner's time with the railways, the Booze Report and the appointment of Ross Sayers as CEO of State Rail. Griner's toolbox was filled with very blunt knives. He knew there were both inefficiencies in the rail system, but also support for labour from the unions emanating from it. The Booze Report was very tough, though very fair. Your mad professor has made a copy of it available online. See the links below. Pointing out that, task by task, things like locomotive supply or track maintenance were inefficient, decades behind US practice, something that needed to be said. The Booze Report sits over enthusiast narratives like a terrible monster. We will look at the role of children's monster narratives in Australian Rail in future episodes, but this one is a classic. They didn't end up doing all of it, which is not a surprise when you remember the National Party was part of this government. A period of being super tough on rail and scaremongering that the large part of the system would close was only short-lived, maybe two years at most. Country services to Tenterfield and Moree were terminated, though later restored by Griner to Moree and Armadale. It could be that the major project of Griner, foisting a corruption narrative on Labor, took up all his capital. He set up the Independent Commission Against Corruption, but unfortunately for Griner, it came first for him. He lost political battles for education and the environment, and after the ICAC finding, he stood down in favour of the milder-mannered John Fay. The dynamic with rail soon turned as well. The end of the Liberal government is remembered in quite a different guise. The Richmond line in Durrett country had finally been electrified after many years of prevaricating by RAN. The line south from Wollongong to Dapto in Durrawal land was also electrified. Though fairly small initiatives, they were helping to reverse the narrative. Ross Sayers had brought in some interesting ideas, with one your mad professor supported, the creation of City Rail as a business within State Rail. And revolutionary for its time, the boundaries were over 200 kilometres from Sydney, north at Musselbrook and Dungog, Lithgow, and south of Sydney at Goulburn and Nowra, with Sydney declared the city for the 2000 Olympics. A major new line to the airport and south was committed to, and Baird had some eclectic interest, including bringing the Svenska Jernvag X2000 train out from Sweden for a test in New South Wales. And his Scandinavian interest did not stop there, with some talk of exchanging the Tangara design for the Danish IC3 intercity rail cars. So by the end of the period, after a tough and unpleasant period of Griner wielding his blunt knife, we saw the New South Wales Railways return to something more like business as usual. And if you want to see real corruption, let's go north to the Bjocchi Peterson government of legend. We discussed in our episode, Our Finest Hour, that the coal industry underwrote the massive growth in rail traffic in Queensland in the 1970s. And happily, the government embarked on both mainline and suburban electrification in the 1980s because of it. 
it was not above Joe to ensure the largesse found its way to friends of his. Don't take your mad professor's word for it. The Fitzgerald inquiry said as much. Hopefully we get to cover the QR of the 1970s and 80s more in future episodes. But suffice to say, Joe's spending is generally well remembered. The innovation of the emu sets, the electric locos, which were better than the low voltage ones supplied to New South Wales. The reopened Cleveland line. The extra tunnels under the city. But even Joe's period saw the loss of rail services. Once degraded Brisbane's outskirts. Like the Ipswich to Tugulua line on Waka Waka land. The remaining small interurban rail motors in Cairns and other provincial cities failure to provide any meaningful rail service to Toowoomba in Burungam country. We cannot allow fondness for rail to divert our attention from the evil this man did, the human rights abuses, the Sequeb case and protest bans, his support for apartheid and his corruption. And finally, let's remember the Labor governments that were probably the least helped to rail, but who should have been the most. That is the governments of Bob Hawke and Paul Keating. Their direct involvement through Australian National in South Australia and Tasmania was always going to be marginal, but the bigger damage was their complete lack of interest in tackling the major national issues. Poor rail freight productivity, the need for a high-speed train on the East Coast, supplementary funding to the states for long overdue rail works, and a fairer financial situation between rail and road. In our episode 8, we put paid to the idea of a road lobby conspiracy to destroy rail, but we never said there wasn't a treasury conspiracy to do exactly that. The 1980s was a period of federal funding for major roads, without any expectation of other funding mechanisms, like higher taxes or tolls on the roads. Meanwhile, rail operators got nothing. Expected to pay road diesel taxes for roads they themselves didn't use. I doubt Hawke or Keating personally knew about this or cared, but the Federal Treasury and Finance Departments made sure it stayed off the agenda. It is odd because Hawke was known for his consensus nation-building style, while Keating was a man of specific visions for economic reform. He did, near the end, cobble together the national rail idea, but it was a pretty poor showing against what the system required and was not accompanied by the sort of funding such a system would need to be worth doing. The single large project, rerouting the Adelaide line via Cressy, left the line longer, in worse condition, and without much of a passenger train service. It is hard to believe that the Ararat to Ballarat line was abandoned. It had had much investment over the years to make it faster. Only with Brack's election after Kennet was it restored for passengers, but not for freight. There are other tales we could have used to illustrate the difference between a fair understanding of major governments and the rail enthusiast one. Your mad professor would always rather see a Labor government, but knows if you don't hold them to account for poor performance, they will keep on doing it. Next time on Radically Rethinking Railways, we are at a peak in rail construction, a peak that should have come decades ago. It would have cost us a lot less, but does that matter? What would our railways look like if we had? And what will it cost us now? In Trillion is the New Billion. See you then.